Welcome to our conversation about National Sorry Day. We're here at the Queensland State Archives and this conversation is a collaboration between Queensland State Archives and the Kayabra Community Association. My name is Rose Barracliffe. I'm a Butchelor woman and I am the First Nations Archives Advisor here at Queensland State Archives. And here with me today is Auntie Janet Blair, mm. um, otherwise known as Auntie Jay. And Auntie Jay, you're also Butchelor. Yes. And Wapabara and Mananjali. Mananjali. So we have a we have a family community connection, connection. as well. Yeah, it so. feels like family. It feels like it feels there's a sense of ease, you know, being with, you know, someone who's from your own mob, you know, that connection and yeah, it's it's wonderful, wonderful to be here and, and to meet you. Yeah. yeah. You too. Thank mm. you for being here today. Before we start our conversation today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, but also all across Queensland. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today um, here in South East Queensland um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Yeah. Auntie Jay has worked with Stolen Generation members for years as a nurse and midwife and then as a project officer. She has lived in remote and regional communities as part of her work to deliver services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Her father was a member of Stol the Stolen Generations, taken from his mother and sent to a mission, and then later adopted by family members, but essentially lost contact with his birth mother due to the dislocation effects of past policies. Auntie Jay is currently a producer with BMAC, Brisbane Multicultural Arts Centre, and as part of that role there, she works with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people around creative expression and storytelling, which are well-documented methods of healing and truth-telling. Through her work and family and community connections, she continues to witness the impact of past policies that led to the forced removal of tens of thousands of children from their homes. She sees firsthand the impacts of intergenerational trauma and the need for a better response to healing and reconciliation. Oh, that was a lot to take in and, and hear someone talk about yourself. But before we begin, I'd like to pay my respects and honour my ancestors, um, the Bachelor Mananjali Wapabara people on my mum's side and on dad's side, Waka Waka and Cobble Cobble. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that. And, um, and, th and there's a little bit of clarification about some of that stuff you mentioned about um, my family. And I think this is where having this candid conversation, um, you know, around stolen generation and what actually stolen generation means and the terminology because dad was one of the fortunate children to be adopted like you said or and they wouldn't have seen it as adoption they would have seen it as just bringing him home and being part of the family but as you know he was born in Wandai in 1941 and um, and his mum was quite young when she had him and then he was transferred all, almost immediately into Sherberg Mission and that disconnection began. And for me, Dad would never see himself as the stolen generation person because of, he, he said I was just fortunate enough, but he was stolen because he was robbed of his childhood mm. and the connection with his birth mother, my grandmother. Um, and we were robbed of the connection with her because she was forced into, as many young Aboriginal men and women were forced into labour against their will. They didn't have any choices mm. because of the government policies of um, assi assimilation and segregation. So we know that a lot of people wouldn't say they're stolen generation, but their, their livelihood and their childhood and their connection to culture was stolen. Mm. So absolutely. Because I would say to Dad, you know, Dad, you know, oh, I wasn't stolen, but really forced onto a mission against your will. Mm. Hundreds of other children forced onto that mission. You know, they came from everywhere. They were forced to speak English. They were denied their own cultural, you know, laws and customs and to practice them. So they were stolen as well. Lots of things were stolen and they are a stolen generation of their culture. And, um, and I think that's what um, the organisation, you know, that you're working for, um, and seeing the impacts, it's it's still occurring and the impacts are there and it's and it's really important to understand what that looks like because it is PTSD, it is trauma, um, it is um, disconnection, 
to so much. My dad wasn't able to learn his language and practice his laws and customs. Mm. You know, he's still a, a proud Aboriginal man um, who fought under a flag that didn't recognise him in this country. Mm. And that's a travesty in itself. Yeah. yeah. So through the work you do with BMAC, how do you see the effects of this trauma playing out and what? how are you working with that, with our mob? I've only been working for them officially permanent part-time for about six weeks. Okay. Very short amount of time. But in that, that short time, what I've seen from the First Nations artists that I've had some conversations and yarns with is um, creating stories using language that we're still learning, creating stories that represent their families and the disconnection, hurt and trauma. But also out of that is joy and celebration yeah. that we're still here. So the past policies and of this government, Queensland, you know, try to destroy us, try to disconnect us, try to break us down has only made us more resilient and stronger, mm. you know, because you can live with trauma, but the, but the other flip side to that, and I believe it's in your DNA, is your connection to culture. Even though you may not know every single part of that, there is still an inherent um, in, your, in your DNA, in your cell memory that resides there and that you can tap into. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with BMAC because it sounds amazing. Well, it's, it's, it's multicultural. Um, um, First Nations um, is part of that process with artists, poets, visual artists, of course. Mm. Um, but it's also recognising the other cultures of, of Brisbane, South, South East Queensland and across Queensland. Mm. So the work is um, um, celebrating the cultures that have made this country their home, um, connecting those cultures with First Nation cultures and celebrating and sharing that, um, um, sharing that community links because we're all part of the same community. Mm -hmm. Um, and also showcasing the talents of First Nations so that people that have um, come to this country, whether it's through asylum, through refugee, through being born here, second or third generation um, um, Australians, you know, because there are a lot of Australian who, the Australians who have African or Asian or, you know, South American background. And it's I also love the fact that I get to learn about other cultures from around the world that have made Brisbane their home. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That sounds fantastic. Um, so tell us a little bit about where we're here to talk about or we're specifically talking about National Sorry Day, which is coming up um, May 26th. Um, and National Sorry Day obviously remembers and acknowledges the mistreatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and who were forcibly removed from their families and communities. So we heard the story of your dad that went through this process as well. Um, my mum also went through a similar thing. Um, so what are your thoughts about this day, National Sorry Day, and how important it is to acknowledge this part of Australia's history? One day in the calendar year is never enough to acknowledge the hurt of what happened to so many First Nations people around this country. It will never be enough. But to have it on the national calendar and to make organisations and communities aware of something that we live with on a daily basis, you know, um, I'll never get back the time of knowing my grandmother or my culture or my law, you know. I, I can learn each day in little bits and pieces, of course we can, and we, bachelor people have, you know, you know, we live on country, you know, Gari Zao, you know, our, our, our Mother Earth in, in ways. But for that day is a day to wake up and for all Australians, because we're all busy and there's all, we've all got things going on in our lives, but to sit quietly and remember and connect with First Nations people and community and say, I acknowledge your hurt and sorrow. Mm. I acknowledge the traumas that the past government policies inflicted upon Aboriginal people. It is still a very, very traumatic day for a lot of people. And when people say, get over it, oh, that happened so long ago. Mm -hmm. No, you cannot talk like that. This, this happened on our land. Um, babies were ripped out of mother's arms. You only have to listen to the stories of a lot of artists like Uncle Archie Roach, mm -hmm. you know. 
a lot of prominent Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander people were and still living with those effects. Mm. Um, a lot of people won't know that a lot of Torres Strait Islander people came down during the war and, and was settled in Sherbrooke and didn't go back to the Torres Straits mm. and end up marrying families down here. And so it does perpetuate in our DNA. You carry that with you and that sorrow and that hurt. And I think when the country, when I say the country, the people of this country who are non-Indigenous or from other countries and other lands need to know our history and acknowledge it and absorb it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a key part of our history, isn't Absolutely. it? We, we need to make sure everyone knows about it. Absolutely. Mm. So you've worked with many communities who've been directly impacted by these policies and um even your father, as we talked about. So what kind of impacts have you witnessed in the communities or within your own family? Mm. I'll talk about the, the negative impacts first because, you know, there's also, there's always, where, where there's joy, there's sorrow. When there's negative, there's positive. And if I think about the negative impacts, you know, the social determinants of health, homelessness, addictions, whether that be to money, grog, Domestic and family violence, suicide, um, all of those things um, that perpetuate the demise of our people. Um, poor health conditions, so dying much younger. Um, poor antenatal care, so, you know, babies born to mums who have affected by alcohol and smoke. Um, loss of culture and law, all those things that connect you to where where your country is and that perpetuates itself in distrust of systems, distrust of me as a nurse and midwife who's worked in those communities um, and, a, and a deep level of sorrow and sadness. Mm. I, I'm often talking, and these are stories that probably um, are relevant to so many of our aunties and uncles when you talk to them, especially when they've been stolen generation. You cannot replace your mother and father, mm. the person that gave birth, especially your mother. And then when they go to look for them and they've passed away and this, and they may have found out, they may have had a good life, they may have grown up, they may have done all the things, you know, that. but you can't take away sorrow that deep mm. when it's cut. And one of, my, one of my dear friends, she's actually on country at the moment um, with her mother and her mother was stolen generation. She'll never get back all that she's missed, you know what I mean? She, you, you can't ever, um, and one small day of acknowledging that, yes, it's it's very important, but the sorrow still lives on in your heart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The positive the positive sides of that is the resilience and strength and the willingness to come back and say, I'm still here, I still can practise my culture, I can still go back and, and try to reunite with my family. I've seen resilience and strength and and humour and love in boundless amounts of from people who you think would not be would, would not be able to smile because I think of growing up with my parents and having a mum and dad and I just can't imagine what that would be like if my mother had lost me or I, I had no connection to my mother, yeah. the woman. Or there's a recollection. Um, I wrote, a, I, I wrote a really beautiful story. Um, I, I actually performed it in one of my assessments last year. I'm doing, I'm in my third year of my fine arts degree. And I wrote a, a monologue about escaping from a girl's home and remember being torn from my mother's arms and hiding when I turned 18, I was able to leave the home and how I went along the dirt track and then I saw a familiar car and then it looked like someone who knew me and that connection, you know. Mm -hmm. And I really felt that I was in that moment of being reunited. Um, it was a powerful piece of, of, of performance that we, we had done. And we, and we also talked about Black Lives Matters and, and another impact of that is our high incarceration rates. Mm. Yeah. Extremely high, and women mm. and our children being high rates of um, removal of our babies and young children. Still now, even higher. Today. And higher. And the other thing that is our high um, juvenile justice rates, you know, our kids in the system. Mm. So, yeah, um, we were just talking about this yesterday about 
what are the, some of the things we could do? And we know that when we talk about First Nations culture, it's not just um, dancing, art, visual. It's, it's all encompassing. It's mm. language. It's the connection to country, you know, animals, plants, trees, everything. It's not just siloed. And we had an idea of maybe using some of that with working with women in prisons, you know, and young mm. people in, in the system because we just discovered there's there's gaps in producing and um, lighting and design. I'm, I'm probably going a little bit, sorry guys, going off course here. <laughs> but I think, I mean, it's really important, as you say, that um, culture and also co uh, creative practice are very important for healing in yeah. these process, which is obviously part of the work that you're doing. Um, and do you see much of that in the communities with people reconnecting with culture and that being something oh. that's part of their healing process? Absolutely, because I was a nurse and midwife for many years and so um, I did a lot of antenatal birth education classes because I was, did midwifery group practice and and just seeing, and I think it's wisdom as I've grown older and had a lot of um, yarns and conversations with stolen generation. Just a woman recently in the last few months before the floods impacted the Northern Rivers, I met a woman um, who still really didn't know where she belonged. Mm. And I just said to her, where do you feel you belong? Where is your spirit calling you? Where do you feel? And it was in the, on the country where she was living um, in Northern New South Wales. And I said, do you realize that all the riverways, all the systems, all the oceans, all the mountains, all the trees, we are all connected. There is no, we may have our cultural boundaries, but deep down if you go down, we are all connected. Mm. And I said, unfortunately, you were disconnected from your family and it, and you can see the hurt and pain. Mm. And you just hold that space for that sorrow. And I think this is the other thing too. We don't know how to hold space for sorrow. Mm. We know how to celebrate and put a trophy out and say, oh, wow, yeah. congratulations. But for a human being to sit in someone's sorrow and takes a lot of emotional intelligence to be able to do that. And Annie Miriam Rose from Daily River who talks about the deity, mm. that deep silence and listening, we don't know how to do it. Mm. And it's even harder when someone has trauma and being allowed to them to have that space. And, and that's why Sorry Day is a day where when once the sun comes up that day, we hold space for the still ongoing trauma, the anger, the sorrow. The I, when I've taught classes, um, and there's many things that I've taught over the years, and I've asked people to close their eyes and imagine that when you got home today, your children were missing. You sent your child to school, you came home, and you never saw them again, and they never saw you again. Just think for a moment if your child went to another state to live and they could no longer speak English and they were made to speak another language that was completely foreign to them and they were made to dress it and to absolutely immerse themselves in what that could feel like, I said, well then escalate that by a, a thousand and maybe you, maybe by putting yourself in that place and that's what empathy is about, mm, is the ability to put yourself in someone's, not their shoes, their whole being of who they are and what they missed out on. Mm. What I say to people too when I'm talking about, when we're talking about trauma and loss and grief, I go, nobody's grief or loss is better or greater than anyone's. Because some people say, oh, I feel really guilty for feeling, you know, so I didn't really suffer enough. No, your grief is your grief. You're allowed to express it. You're allowed to feel it and let's acknowledge it. I, ne I never wanted people to compare their grief to someone else's because every, every human being, every spiritual being is allowed that, you know, we have to allow that space. And I never say permission. I say allow that space for them to have their own feelings and not to dismiss it, you know. You know, um, I hate it when I hear people say to someone, I'll just get over it or you'll be right, or, you know, or even to children. You know when children are crying and they've hurt themselves and they've fallen over, I'll oh, get up, you know, you'll be right, just, you know. And that's the other thing, I can see that dismissiveness and you're going to grow up tough and stop being a sookie baby. And I had to pull my dad up many times about um, they're not being a sook dad if they're crying and they've hurt their finger, 
you know, you can't raise everyone tough like you were, Dad, you know. Mm-hmm. he's My child has to be able to do that, Dad. And it's about, and, and seeing that in my own family, and even my mum. My mum was one of 11, but she, her immediate family was 10. And I won't talk about my grandparents because they had very, very tough lives and that manifested itself in other ways and shapes. Um, but mum's always had this, you just get on with life and you just do it and if you lose a job, you just... And I've had to say to mum, mum, it's, like, it's all right if I'm upset about something. That, take, that, takes, that takes a long time to talk to your parents, but also then it's good to have a mother like that because she doesn't let you feel sorry for yourself too long. You know, <laughs> yeah. She, my mum was probably my dad was probably the big softy. Mum was the real, you know, yeah. just get on with stuff. Yeah. And I go, mum, I'm I'm really sad that you know a lot A B C D, because she goes, well, I never had it, and she'll often say to me, I never had a childhood. I was, mm. she was cooking and making dinner and cleaning at a very very young age. Expected to do way more than she was, and and for me that is stolen generation too, because she was. Her childhood was stolen from her because of the impacts to her parents. Mm-hmm. I think know? I love how you've explained that because I think people often think of stolen generation simply of the act of removing a child from a parent, but it's so much more than that. You taking away their culture, their language, their childhood, their innocence. Yeah. You know, it's stealing a lot more than just yeah. a direct relationship between a parent and a child. And I think even I've come to that realization of of realizing that there are so many layers and so many, and just because someone's healed and found, it doesn't mean they don't revert back into that pain. And we've got to remember that it's easily, something can trigger something, a smell, a sound, a song on the radio, the sound of horses, the sound of a door slamming, you know, and when all of those things impact on your senses, you know, and we're all of us as human beings, we're very sensual people. You know, we respond to soft, loud, noise, and you know, those, things to remember. And I wish I had been taught much more in school about stolen generation. I wasn't. I was sort of aware, you know, you know, as you were growing up as a teenager, you're just interested in yourself, you know, not so much the rest of the world. But as I was a nurse and I was the only black nurse visible in a very racist system, and Rockhampton was, is what's what was one of the racist hospitals and community because you got Warabinda and I grew up sticking out and I always had to make sure that I was a hundred times better than everyone else and I knew that intrinsically Janti you've got to be better do better your dressings everything you do will be judged because they'll see you coming in and often I was mistaken even when I graduated I was often mistaken for the the cleaners you know yeah oh yeah oh and I would say oh hello Mr Brown I'm actually your I'm your registered nurse looking after you tonight oh Oh, it's so good to see one of you's here. You know, just everything. But I've always, I've always um, flipped it onto humour. I go, what do you mean? You know, I'm deadly good-looking, black, you know, woman. <laughs> they go, oh, oh, and they realise. You know, I've been called every single name that you could ever think of. You know, even in my career and working and years of it as well. But I always just go, you know what, Janti, when you know better, you do better. Still treat that person with respect. Um, I've pulled that, to, you know, and as you get older and, you, and you're more experienced and skilled, you do get the words to say, hold on a minute, Mr Brown, what's going on for you today? You, can I help you with something? Those words have helped me in so many situations to, um, to alleviate um, to violence. And when we talk about the perpetuation and what are the negative effects, the negative effects are there are people wielding guns and ammunition and things and power and control and they've wielded it in such a way that they don't know how to listen and they don't know how to to step back. And I know, yes, you've got to protect yourself, but I have been in so many communities where I've not, never had a gun in my hand but I've managed to um, work myself out of it, work myself into it, be safe and make sure everyone's around without shooting anybody. Mm. It's skills and ability. And communication is such communication. an important um, tool that I, doesn't get enough attention how to communicate properly and you know back to like Didiri and yeah. that deep listening there just seems to be a deep lack of that these days I know it's not practiced enough. I know it's not practiced and to stop listening and be alert for situations where things change you but see there's an innate sense when you know something's got you change the way you speak you get people you do things to make a situation less volatile and you remove yourself you know 
whether that's, you know, going to a different part, you know. But I think that's and, – and even in domestic violence or – I've I've been in so many situations and I think to myself, gosh, Janty, but I think – when people know you really have got their best interests at heart. Being a midwife in a community too, where everyone's related to everybody and everyone's connected, maintaining that confidentiality and maintaining a sense of trust is is probably what has also got me through a lot of... I, I will never discuss any woman's, you know, history or where they are. I've actually looked after women who are pregnant by the same man, you know, and you go, and how do you navigate that? You know, I know. And you think... And they and they're things that the community entrusts you with to keep, you know, to to um, so that you are a place where you know. I always think um, he's not one of my favourite gurus, but Doctor Phil always says, "Be someone's safe place to fall. Be someone's safe place that they know when they walk in the door that there's no judgment from you." Yeah, that's nice. Mm. I like that. So. The importance of National Sorry Day is really that deep listening and holding space at least for one day to be yes. able to understand the impacts of the stolen generations um, and how that's still playing out today. Yeah. And that's what I say, for one day, be, on the, be, be aware that it's not just one day we think about it and we have to live with it. It's ongoing. And so... For you know, non-indigenous Australians, um, being willing to to listen to those stories again and again, and to be respectful mm. and mindful, and and especially when you go into um, into hospital situations or where you're working, and you come across somebody, and you're doing their family history, and you realise their stolen generation, and how you treat that person. I think we should all be treating each other with kindness and respect, mm. but also being aware of when someone's distrustful, that can come out in anger and impatience and not listening. Mm. People say, oh, she didn't, she wouldn't follow our orders, you know. Well, you know what, did you listen to her? Did you really take time to understand who that person is sitting before you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I know we have, that's something we're really trying to consider here at Queensland State Archives as well, is that when people come to connect with records that might hold some of these difficult histories, yes. um, just being respectful of everything that they bring with them, um, their family history, their own life experience and how that will affect how they interact with the record and with this place as well yeah absolutely um, yes yes yeah it's really important well thanks so much for being here for this yarn today it's really great to meet you and have this have this yarn is there anything else you wanted to add i would just say for national sorry day for everyone that listens to this um take a moment to reflect and remember and to acknowledge that that pain and disconnection still manifests itself in the people that you're working with, the people that you go to the shops, the people your children go to school with, the person that is homeless, the person that is in powers of of wonderfulness. And when I think about this, I think of, you know, our nurses, doctors, lawyers, everyone has a story. They don't might not share that complete story with you, but always remember that behind someone's sadness and grief and loss is also joy. But to remember to treat every um, First Nation, especially our elders as well, with respect and love and compassion and to remember that for the grace of God go you who, if you were raised with your parents, have that connection to your culture, how blessed you are, and to remember that they're still longing for that connection and they still belong and they still have their cultural rights, their cultural belonging, and not to dismiss that and to welcome them. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So thank you so much for listening in today and hoping you get time to practice some deep listening and, and leave space for, for all of this on National Sorry Day. Thanks. <laughs>